mai te puku ki te whatu manawa, mai te whatu manawa ki te hiningaro, mai te hiningaro ki te whārangi. From the puku to the heart, from the heart to the mind, from the mind to the page. Tēnā koutou katoa. Kei i taku iti, kei taku rahi, he kupu pōwhiri e nei ki a koutou katoa, kua whakarau i ka mai nei i tēnei ahi ahi pō. To the multitudes who have gathered in person and online, we welcome you here this evening. Kei ngā mana whenua katoa o te whanganui ātara, te ū poko o te ika. Koutou e pupuri ana ki ngā ahi kā. Ara taranaki whānui, te ati awa ngāti toa rangatira anō hoki. Tēnā koutou katoa. To the sovereign tribes of te whanganui atara, the head of the fish. Taranaki whānui, te ati awa ngāti toa rangatira, you who hold fast to the burning home fires. Ki te whari e tūnei, te pūna mā tau ranga o Aotearoa, he pūna wai kōrero e pūpū ake nei, tēnā koutou. To this whare, under the spine of which we have gathered, the National Library of Aotearoa, we acknowledge you. E ngā whakateitei ki te whenua, ngā tamarahi ki te rangi o tērā, ngā kaumātua, me ngā kanohi pākeke tai atu ki ngā mokopuna, nau mai, haru mai. Highly esteemed elders and leaders, kaumātua, whānau, friends, near and far, children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, welcome, welcome, welcome. <coughs> e te mā e te whitiki o te ki, e te mā reikura, weaver of words. E te whakarākei o ngā reringa waiwaiā, you who crafts beautiful stories. Kua tai mai nei koe, ki te toha toha atu, i o whakaaro hohonu ki au mātou. We thank you for coming here tonight to share your knowledge with us. I runga i te ngākau whakaiti, ka tuku mihi ki ākoe. With a humble heart, we greet you. Kia ora. He uri ahau no Ngāti Tukurihe, Ngāti Tua Rangatira Te Ati Aua Hoki, ko Ana Hera Gilday tō ko ingoa. Nō no Ngāti Hine, nō no Ngāpuhi Ahau, ko Nadine Ann Hura tō ko ingoa. It is our great honour to be here representing Te Hā o Ngāpau Kaituhi Māori. This Pā Harakeke grassroots organisation is one that Renee herself was a part of in the early days of her writing career. And we are members in the early days of our writing careers. This, this is Papa Papa. Our work is connected to the past, to the present, and to future writers to come. We would now like to offer an opening karakia uh, that celebrates this endless cycle of creation. Feel free to join in. <coughs> Ko te pū te mōre te we u te aka te rea Ko te waonui te kune te whe te kore te pō Ki ngā tangata Māori ngā rangi raua ko papa Ko te nei te timatanga ko te ao Ko te nei te timatanga o te ao. Ko te pū te mōre te we u te aka te rea. Ko te waonui te kune te whe te kore te pō. Ki ngā tangata Māori ngā rangi raua ko papa. Ko te nei te timatanga. Ko te ao, ko te nei te timatanga, o te ao. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Rachel S. and Toko Ingoa, no te Papa Oia a hau. Ko te Pauhoaki o te Puna Matharanga o Aotearoa, ko te Pauhoaki a hau. No mai, hari mai, 
ki te tātou whare puka puka ara te puna mataranga o Aotearoa, ne te mihi ki a katou tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome to the National Library. I'm Rachel Essen, the National Librarian, and I'm delighted to be welcoming you here to our wonderful auditorium uh, for the 2021 Read New Zealand Te Po Muramura Pānui. What a wonderful occasion. How lucky are we that it's in person? I'm sure there'll be a few references to that. Uh, and from the sublime and beautiful uh, karakia to the pragmatic. Uh, no event, of course, is um, possible without a health and safety briefing. And I did overhear someone uh, rightly say that this is one of the most safe buildings in Wellington. We actually won an award for enduring concrete. So that is very good news. Thank you for following our COVID guidelines. We want to keep you all safe. In the event of a fire, please make your way out of the exits to the side here and at the back and turn left into Aitken Street. Library staff will be there to guide you and we're the ones that have got these passes. In the event of an earthquake, please assume a brace position as though you were on an aeroplane. Once the shaking stopped, wait for instructions. In the event of any other alert or emergency, please stay calm and await instructions from the staff. That's it from me. Noho ora mai. Ko Peter toku ingoa, na mihi nui. Kia koutou. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this Read New Zealand Taipo Muramura Pānui. This is the one for 2021. And I'm Peter Biggs, I'm Chair Emeritus of Read New Zealand after holding the chair role for a number of years. Now, lest you think that the Chair Emeritus title is pompous and pretentious, <laughs> I, I assure that it's not. I perform a vital function. It's not that simply that the older guy has to be put in a holding pen for a while until the new chair comes in. And one of my vital tasks that I have to do today, and I'm delighted to do today, is uh, introduce Renee uh, to you all. Um, again, um, building on, on what Rachel said, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, we are lucky to have the opportunity to get together in person, although we are following some safe guidelines, and thank you um, for, for uh, indulging us with that. Um, and also I want to warmly welcome those uh, who are coming in as, the, as an audience uh, via live stream. Um, the Read New Zealand Tapo Muramura Pānui is an opportunity and a landmark opportunity every year for one of Aotearoa New Zealand's leading writers to discuss an aspect of literature close to their heart. And we are honoured, we are excited, we are thrilled beyond belief to have Rene, an award-winning playwright, poet and novelist, um, to deliver this year's Panui. I, I was a younger man in 1984. Many of you, I'm sure, weren't around at all looking at the youth of our audience. But as a younger man just out of university, um, uh, uh, downstage, I think, was um, performing uh, Wednesday to Come. And that was a sensation, um, not only in, in, in this city, but, but throughout this country. And that's when I first discovered the power and the insight and, and the miracle of Rene. And then uh, I'm lucky to also chair Featherston Booktown. We were so thrilled to have you at, at Featherston Paitamukai um, this year, Rene. Um, and again, uh, this is the first time I'd met you. And uh, everybody talked about Rene being at Featherston Booktown. All 7,000 people, their highlight was Rene because you are a person of provocation of insight, of wisdom, of perspective, of energy, and of, of huge talent. So we are thrilled um, that you will deliver your panui this year called, If You Don't Get Your Head Out of a Book, My Girl, You'll End Up on Queer Street. And um, I, I look at it as a kind of love letter to reading and books, and, and your mother, Rose, I know, plays a, a central part in your story and your panui. Um, it's amazing 
having read the, the Pānui earlier so I could write the foreword to it, um, that reading has transformed Renee's life in so many different ways. And we'll hear more about that from Renee um, very soon. What, what's become clear to me, thinking about what you wrote and how quickly you wrote it, I think you're our most efficient, is that right, Juliet, Pānui deliverer? Um, I'm sure you've got many other things going on in your life, but bang, the copy was there so quickly, and it didn't need a heck of a lot of editing. So it was fantastic. Thank you, Renee. Um, what, what's really interesting is how strongly your experience of, of life and reading aligns with the kaupapa of Read New Zealand Te Pau Mora Mora. We are here to promote storytelling in all its forms and better lives for all New Zealanders through reading. I'd like to thank Luke Pearson sitting there, whose generous donation made this Pānui possible. Generous people, um, and also Stephen Wainwright, who, who funds Read New Zealand Te Pau through Creative New Zealand. Not you personally, Stephen, but, but your team, of course. But we'd love you to, when you step down, to be a donor. Um, uh, <laughs> And um, I've got some forms for you to sign after, after we leave here. But um, the arts and literature only happen through the generosity of individuals and also through the generosity um, of organisations like Creative New Zealand and the New Zealand government. And we are enormously grateful to you, Luke, enormously grateful to Creative New Zealand for your support, and enormously grateful, Rachel, for the support of the National Library. Thank you for hosting us here today. And so I think that's enough from the Chair Emeritus. Um, uh, I pompously, I could go on for some time, um, but, but um, Juliet has given me strict instructions to get out and get off, and there's nothing more for me to do now than to thank you, Renee, for writing and delivering this year's Pānui. Please come to the stage. You're warmly welcome. Kia ora. Thank you. I'll turn this on. Kia ora koutou, <coughs> talofa lava, ni hao, aula. You don't, if you don't get your head out of a book, my girl, you'll end up on Queer Street. I was born in 1929, the year Jean Devaney left Aotearoa, New Zealand, and for good, because her novel, The Butcher's Shop, had been widely condemned and also the year Virginia Woolf's Room of One's Own was published. New Zealanders were horrified and repelled by Devaney's novel. It was heresy. This beautiful, idyllic, green and pleasant place, dotted with little white woolly lumps that barred or larger brown clumps that mooed. There was sun always shining. And this woman... This woman had portrayed it as a violent and murderous place for both women and cattle. Oh dear me, no. We can't have that. It didn't help that Jean was a communist. Wolf, from an illustrious British upper middle class family, well educated, married to Leonard, large house, servants, wrote about the necessity for a woman to have a room of her own. At the time, I imagine, I was only interested in sucking milk and sleeping, but I'd place a bet that Rose read, my mother Rose read The Butcher's Shop, and I wondered about her perspective as a farm worker's wife. As for Virginia's idea of a room of her own, it would never have occurred to Rose as a possibility when she was growing up. She might perhaps have dreamed of a bed of her own. My father shot himself in 1934, the year Nio Marsh's first crime novel, A Man Lay Dead, was published, and the year the Reform Party in New Zealand put off the election because they thought they'd lose. They weren't, there were no great thinkers in the Reform Party, but they got that one right. <laughs> Gordon Coates, their finance minister, completely unable to explain his financial plan and management even to his colleagues, or indeed to anyone else, was said to have told out-of-job workers who complained about lack of money to feed their families that they could eat grass. I don't think he did say this, but it didn't matter. It was like putting it up on Facebook. 
Everyone believed it. He had said it. It was the kind of thing he did say. So the election was put off and 1934 became the forgotten year, but not for me. I remember 1934 because it was the year my mother taught me to read. Rose knew about hard work. She'd lived or existed through the headlines and reality of my father's death. Young farmer shoots himself, screamed the headlines. Pākehā man married to Māori woman, great copy, fulfilled all expectations. Editors and readers loved it. The house went with the job, so once my father wasn't there to do the job, we were chucked out. Rose got a room with Daisy, and she and us three kids lived in one of the big front rooms in this old villa on Guppy Road, Green Meadows in Hawke's Bay. When Rose looked for a house to rent, this was a pretty hard ask. A young Maori woman with three kids whose husband had shot himself, nah, landlords were not lining up. Daisy's husband was in jail. She had four kids, which increased to six after her next two, the two times he came out of jail. And Daisy was a working class Scot, I think, or maybe Cockney, a small, pretty, garrulous and good-hearted woman. And she needed the money. So getting a room, giving a room to another outsider helped both, them, both of them. What didn't help was my continual questioning. Why have we moved? Why are we here? What is that word? That word was either in the big black headlines of the Daily Telegraph, the local paper, or in the reports. And so it was in that little room on Guppy Road that grieving, lonely and heartbroken Rose began teaching me to read. She'd gone to St Joseph's in Wairau. She and her older sister, Mary, ended up in the same class because Mary was a sickly girl who was often away and who eventually died aged 33 of tuberculosis. One day, Rose got the answer to Sister's question first and hissed it to Mary. Sister strapped them both. Mary got three for not presenting her own question, her own answer, I mean, and Rose got six for telling her the, the right one. Unsurprisingly, Rose hated school, but the one thing she learned was to read. She was a fast and voracious reader. She liked being taken away from this world and transformed, transported to another better one. Or perhaps it was that she liked the respite from the thinking about money, rent and food. She read anything and she liked to read in peace. I saw Rose staring at these black marks on a white page, and I was curious. Rose was short, dark, good-looking, highly intelligent, hard-working and irritable. When she had time off, she liked it uninterrupted. So when she began telling me the words, she expected me to remember them. I knew a lot of words, but I didn't have much idea how to join them together. She was an impatient woman, and I am too, so I understand and know how it irked her when I asked her the word, meaning of a word again, a word she'd already told me. <clears throat> I have a good memory, and I didn't, it didn't take me long to recognise the words again and know what they meant. I do not mean I understood them. <clears throat> I just had an idea. We moved into a rental house and there, as successive landlords decided to sell, we moved to another one and another one. And as rents went up, the houses she could afford gradually got grottier and grottier. I went to Green Meadows Primary School, which had primers one to four and standards one to four. I tore through the primers in year in a year simply because I could pick out words. In standard one, I learned very quickly how to put little joining words between the, them to make the sentence. The world opened up. I began to read stories. 
I liked learning and I loved, loved, loved reading. And the bonus was that this got me approval from the teachers. I hated the playground, hated not being friends with someone, anyone. <laughs> hated the sidelong glances, the whispers. So there I was, liking the classroom, loathing the outside world. Sometimes I wished I'd be naughty and sent to a room with a book and told to read it, which was what had happened to some kids, but never to me. <laughs> I couldn't deliberately be naughty because Rose would be furious. She was very decided on what she saw as good manners. You said please and thank you. You did not say can, can I, when you should say may I. The teachers never quite knew how to make, take me. Pretty little thing, pity she's so dark, said one to another as they stood in front of me. Did they think I was deaf? They never put me higher than second in the end of year tests. I suppose it would not have done to have this little dark girl whose mother was Maori and whose father had shot himself to be placed first. However, I liked the work and I liked learning, so I had a sort of love-hate relationship with the whole thing. Michael Joseph Savage and the Labour Party were delighted to have had the extra year. It gave them just that little bit of extra time to sort themselves out and storm to victory in 1935, the year one of my all-time favourite novels, Gordy Knight by Dorothy L. Sayers, was published. <clears throat> I didn't read it till I was 11, and although I didn't fully understand it, I got the main theme, which was about the fact that when a woman got married, she gave up any hope of a career and became subservient to her husband, bearing his children, being a good mother, and making baking for church socials. If we were middle or upper class and could afford a nanny, a cook and a housemaid, you might be allowed to interest yourself in some charitable society cause or cause. Michael Joseph spoke the language of the out-of-work farmer, preacher, hospital worker. He spoke the same language as the poor. He'd been hard up himself. Christened Michael, he'd added the name Joseph in memory of his brother, who died when quite young. Like thousands of others, Rose had his photograph on the wall. It hung along the front it hung along from the dog collar, which Rose used to strap us when we did something really wrong. In our house there were grades of punishment, a good shouting at, a lot of swearing, no pudding to bed without with no tea, and last resort, the strap. I only got the strap once. I'd put three oranges on Rose's bill at the grocer's. She knew to a penny how much the bill would be, so it was a shock when she found out that there were extra items. I remember that huge longing when I looked at the oranges, then the idea, then the giving in to temptation. I had intended to give my brother and sister one each, but I ate one and could not resist eating another one, so my brother dipped out. <clears throat> when Rose challenged us, my sister denied she'd eaten one, so I got the full brunt of, of Rose's shame and fury. Not only had I done the wrong thing, I had made a fool of her because she'd queried the bill, and Mr Rundle had told her, in front of two other people, that I had put them on the bill. She felt I'd added to the shame she experienced on a daily basis, that of being Māori in a Pākehā community. Rose, after she got home from working weeding carrots, would make herself a cup of tea, roll a cigarette from yellow zigzag paper and her tin of Melrose tobacco, light up and read. She had an internal clock, and when that buzzed, she got up, prepared tea, prepared, cooked it, she was a terrible cook, and when it was time, commanded us to wash our hands, we might be poor, but we can be clean, was her mantra. 
I thought of Rose when Dr. Susie Wiles told us that cleaning everything with soap and water was best and that frequent hand washing was the answer to frightening COVID away. Rose would have approved. Once I learned to read, I read in bed, I read in the lavatory, I read walking down the long drive to the letterbox, I read walking along the road to school. I read girls' annuals, single stories, and then when I was around seven or eight, I discovered real novels, long stories that went on and on. It was pure bliss, and at first I loved the novelty of them. However, after the first heady exhilaration and reading each one two or three times, I got very bored. The kids in the books went to boarding school where they had midnight feasts, which I thought was mad. Why would you get up in the middle of the night and have a feed? And they were always saying scrumptious. <laughs> what the hell did that mean? I didn't know anyone who said scrumptious. I mean, if I'd said it in front of Rose, she'd probably have said, don't get funny with me, my girl. One day, I was moodily looking for something to read and I picked up Rose's library book. Rose hated going out. She went out on pension day when she went to the post office and collected her widow's pension. Then she would go to Mr Rundle where she paid the grocery bill and bought her one treat, a packet of Capstan 10 tailor-maids. She saved these cigarettes for special occasions or perhaps for when she was feeling tired or discouraged. She eked them out so that the pleasure lasted. Yes, she hated going out, but she loved reading. She, so she had to go once a week to borrow books from the library. The Taradale Library was a lovely place, situated at the back of the town hall, with brown walls and a smiling librarian. I'd enjoyed Anne of Green Gables by L.M. Montgomery, and the rest of the Anne books, and then I loved Emily of New Moon and the rest of the Emily books, but I couldn't go on reading and rereading them forever. The alternative seemed to be the um, scrumptious ones. So, yeah, nah, uh, to them. In desperation, I picked up one of Rose's library books. These were crime novels, Agatha Christie, Margaret Allingham, Nio Marsh, Dorothy Sayers, later to be known as the Queens of Crime. Of course they were. Of course there were other writers too, other books, but these are the main ones I remember. Dorothy L. Sayers was the best writer, I de decided later, but they all held my interest. They were puzzling though. There were manor houses. There were butlers. People said, rather... The working class characters were always slow and stupid and it was always left to the upper class sleuth to solve the murder. Hercule Poirot was re regarded with suspicion at first because he was a foreigner, but he overcame that, by, that handicap by using his little grey cells and solving the murders. These novels were racist, sexist and classist, but 10 year old, I didn't notice that. In, an, in any case, these were people in books. They weren't real, were they? So I concentrated on the puzzle. Unfortunately, Rose didn't care whether I was in the middle of a murder case. If she'd read the last line in her sixth book, um, she'd gather up all the others and stick them in a basket and walk up to the library to return them and take out some more. I got used to making up my own ends to the stories which were a little like reading about life on Mars anyway. Some of them even said scrumptious. I made up my mind that if I ever got an invite to a weekend party at a manor house, I would refuse. I had no wish to be str strangled or shot or stabbed in a library locked on the inside. Ro Rose eventually decided that if I was old enough to read her library books, I was old enough to go to the library and change them. This was a fraught business, 
because I had to remember what she'd read or hope the librarian had kept the card up to date. The books I borrowed were entered on a card, but once on the card, once the card was full, a new one started. It depended how busy the librarian was, whether she had time to check the, the cards at the back of the, of the box. I either had a good memory or was just plain lucky because Rose never complained. I was coming up to 12 and looking forward to going to high school until a few weeks before my birthday when Rose said, you can't go to high school, we haven't got the money. You can go to work and then that means Jimmy and Val can go to high school. I was upset, angry, hurt beyond measure, but I didn't dream of arguing. I turned 12, left school and got a job at the Woolen Mills around Pandora Point in Ahariri. I told the manager I was 15 and he pretended to believe me. I caught the workers bus at 7.30 a.m. I was paid 22 shillings a week. The bus ticket cost four shillings. I gave Rose 10 shillings and I had eight to go mad with. A week or two after I started work, a man in a tweed overcoat and his wife came to live down our street. They were from England. On the way to the bus one morning, he said, you like reading? Yes, I said. I had no idea how to talk to adults and he didn't have much of an idea how to talk to kids either. He probably thought I was older than I was. Everyone else did. What do you like reading, he asked. Books, I said. <laughs> this must have been a bit discouraging, but he persevered. Here's a newspaper about books, he said, and he gave me my first copy of John of London's Weekly and continued to do so every week until two years later when he moved away. I loved them. I wrote in my memoir, These Two Hands, about the effect they had on me. They had articles about writers, about books, about plays. They published poems and wrote about poets. They had letters to the editor, some of them not very nice. Here I was, sitting on the workers' bus, going into Napier, reading about books, writers, playwrights, poets, in that faraway place called England. And like a little literary vacuum cleaner, I sucked up all the words, stories, reviews, poems, letters to the editor. I read voraciously. I was only happy when I was reading. Rose had sent us to the Methodist Sunday School so she could have a lie-in on Sundays and have a cup of tea. At Sunday school, we were divided into things that boys did and things that girls did. Boys sang Dare to Be a Daniel, but girls were not allowed to sing that song. <laughs> girls learned text and sang Wide, Wide as the Ocean, Blue as the Heavens Above. We had hymn books and we learned hymns off by heart. We were told that every time we did a good deed, there would be another star in our crown, so that when we died, we would go straight to heaven, where we'd sit at the feet of Jesus. I wasn't too shook on the idea of sitting at anyone's feet, but hey, better than being cast into the flames, which seemed to be the other option. <laughs> Books took me into new worlds. They told me things, some interesting, some not. I read the Bible, which was a bit startling, but I plugged on, only understanding about a tenth of it. I read the Bible three times, the last one when I was 16, and I decided enough was enough. I started to form some sort of consciousness about the world, or at least the world of books. I read Essie Summers and Rosemary Rees, who both made fortunes from their light romances. I knew they were froth, they had no relationship to real life, but that was good. Sometimes real life was too hard. I never got over not going to high school. It wasn't the education. Anyone can get an education if they've got access to books. 
It was the large gap that opened up between me and my own age group. It seemed to me that the rest of the world had been high to high school and I hadn't. <clears throat> the chan chance to form friendships, to observe different lives, to compare and contrast other lives with mine and to grow at the same rate as others was absent. And as it was, I grew up very lopsided. Instead of forming friendships with girls my own age, I read books. The only relations that I that visit, the only relations that visited regularly were my father's brothers, my uncle Cliff and my uncle Ormond. I loved Ormond, and he was very good to me. He went off to war, and I missed him enormously. Later, their two sisters became regular visitors, and so did my mother's young, uh, younger sister, Grace. Apart from Rose and Grace, the only other Māori I knew were the ones at school, and they were, like me, outsiders. Sometimes I walked past the group of old Māori women who used to sit outside the butcher's shop on the footpath in the sun and smoke, and one of them would say to me, Hey, girl! You Rose Brown's daughter? I used to run past and pretend I didn't hear. I did not read books about this kind of situation. I did not read books about this country, about the towns. I read about other countries, about other rivers, about other mountains. The only female friends I had around my own age was my sister. My workmates were five or ten or maybe more years older. One of them not only told me about sex, but she also told me to show a bit of spine. She said, tell the others you won't answer them. You won't answer to Rini or Brownie. You'll only answer to Rene. So I used my spine and it worked. At the time, I thought I was the only one in the entire world called Rene. Why Rose named me Rene, I'll never know. It was not a family name, although my second name Gertrude was, but every goat in the district was called Gertrude. <laughs> so I grew out of hating my first name and into loving it. My mother taught me to read and she gave me my name. Both of these gifts have served me well. I met Laurie and he fell in love, fell in love with me. I liked that. I liked being the one who was loved. I got engaged and then married at 19 and turned 20 the following July. I had my first son a couple of months before I turned 21. I thought I knew everything and I acted like I did. I read Vera Britton and Rebecca West, read the Mari Stopes Married Love, published in 1918, and I said Laurie had to read it too. Married Love talked about sex and pleasure and said both participants should get pleasure. I hadn't got a clue what that meant. I had very vague ideas about what happened when you went to bed after your marriage, but the books enlightened me. In a way, I think I did know a few th important things. I know and I knew I did not want to end up like Rose or Daisy. I might read light romances sometimes, but I was sceptical, cynical, and I suspected everyone's motives. I chose well when I married, and I got exactly the right person, someone who loved me more than I loved him, who never said no to anything I wanted to do. I wanted to be respectable. I wanted a nice house, nice kids. I wanted everything other people seemed to have. I left the factory and got a job at <coughs> chemist shop, Breen's on Emerson Street in Napier. I stepped up in the world. Working in a shop was superior to working in a woolen mill or a printing factory. Mr Breen was a very good employer and a stickler for good service. I wasn't allowed to serve the shop until I'd dusted the thing three or four times, read all the labels, and asked, and when I asked, I could go straight to the request, to the requested item, take it from the shelf, and hand it to him. 
I wasn't, of course, allowed to sell condoms, which were called French letters. Men would shuffle in furtively to the counter or swagger in, grab a bottle of cough syrup and then ask for three packets. <laughs> Mr Breen always knew what they wanted. There would be a, a hushed sort of mutter, a transaction, and then the man would go out and become part of the Friday night shoppers. I came across the Aho, a magazine that published Maori writers. I read J.K. Sturm and Rowley Habib. At last, I was reading about the people and the country I knew. I was dragged to a rehearsal by a friend and called onto the stage with five others. The director ordered us to scream and I screamed the loudest and I got the part. <laughs> and so began my long love affair with theatre and reading plays. Lou Johnson came to work at the Hawke's Bay Herald Tribune and began a series of poetry readings where he and other poets read their works. I began to read poetry. The last time I saw Lou, he was standing in the foyer at Circa Theatre. He grinned at me and said, the house of Bernarda Alba. This was a low blow. I had played Martirio, one of the daughters in this play by Garcia Lorca. The story was about an old woman who had seven daughters and none of them, younger ones, were allowed to marry until the oldest one married, which was not going to happen. The director said, when you stand there, I want you to show repressed sexuality. <laughs> so I stood there, but I did not show repressed sexuality. I didn't have a clue how to show repressed sexuality, or unrepressed sexuality for that matter. It was not the sort of thing you could look up in the dictionary either, or roll up and ask a neighbour about. In the play, the guy wants to marry the young sister. He hangs himself. But hanging was a bit quiet, the director thought. She wanted something more dramatic, so she decided he'd shoot himself. In his scathing review, Lou Johnson tore the production to pieces. He didn't actually say, I failed, the repressed sexuality test, but he was furious about the director's cheek in changing the ending. So we all bore the brunt, and we all hated him. But standing there at Encirca all those years later, both older and wiser, we laughed about it. I began teaching English and history at Wairau College by accident. Their regular teacher got sick. I was studying history extramurally from Massey, so I was asked to fill in. I had not been to Teachers College, but I'd had 20 years in theatre. I'd read hundreds of books and a couple of hundred plays. I was short and skinny with a deep voice. I was told via Facebook last year by one of the students in, the first, in that first class that when I walked into the classroom, no one took any notice. Um, they, when I said, stop talking, they just kept on talking. So she said, you stuck dark side of the moon on very loud and we all got such a shock we stopped talking. <laughs> I had not read any books about teaching, but I had done 12 years, 20 years in theatre. So I knew about preparation and performance. And after that first shock, we all got on okay. My kids and I went on a summer holiday to Mahia. I read Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. And I read somewhere in a magazine that Elvis's favourite sandwich filling was peanut butter, bacon and banana. Bob Dylan had arrived in the early 60s with the times they are a-changing, and they were. But for the moment, we didn't take any notice. The kids dug for Pippi, collected power, bought fish and chips. I read, and I read, and we were happy. Then 1972 and Broadsheet came along. What a breath of fresh air that was. I loved it and waited impatiently for each new issue. 
I went to the United Women's Convention here in Wellington where Margaret Mead told us to go home and do something. Wairoa had three pubs and a working men's club which catered for men and for women there was something called a woman's rest which was a small concrete edifice containing a lavatory and a wash basin. <laughs> Clearly room for improvement. So we shouted a bit talked to the council, the JCs, the Lions, and finally we got some, a larger room with hot water and a kettle and something com some comfortable seats. And the Wairoa Women's Centre was opened by Sonia Davies. I read New Zealand Listener, New Zealand Women's Weekly, New Idea. I read a hundred of plays. I read Arapira Blanc, Rowley Haybib, Witty Himara, Patricia Grace, Fiona Kidman, Rachel McAlpine. I read Germaine Greer. I read English and American feminists, and I directed plays. I directed numerous plays for Wire or Little Theatre. The last one, a feminist play called Sweetie Pie, which caused a huge stir. Three women who'd worked on the play left their husbands. So when there was a little theatre, when the little theatre wrote their history. They left every play I'd ever <laughs> directed out of it. <laughs> they even left out all the work I'd done cleaning the dunnies. <laughs> After I wrote my memoir, a woman who'd been in that play called and came to see me, and we agreed that leaving me and my work out of their history was on a par with the general history of this country, which it didn't like which, if it didn't like what had happened, just cut it out. This is until Vincent O'Sullivan and a few others wrote the real history and showed that what had been called history before was a fantasy of the colonists who did not want anyone to think dear Governor Gray was a land-grabbing, money-sucking hypocrite. Don't hold back, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> In the 80s, when I did the 20th century women's literature paper with the lecturer Aurora McLeod, she took me right into the heart of what was happening in women's, hand, women's writing. I was introduced to the American poet Adrian Rich. The first poem of hers I ever read began, A wild patience has taken me this far. And I thought, Kapai, Adrian, Kapai. She was a lesbian feminist, poet, essayist. Walking up Albert Park to university, I remembered when Janet Frame's Owls Do Cry came out in 1957, when Ruth Francis The Grace and Spinster by Sylvia Ashton Warner in 1958, and how exhilarating they were to read. And right then, in Albert Park, I felt a huge delight I might not have gone to high school. I might, not, I might be cleaning toilets to earn money, but I was at university. I was reading Adrian Rich and Broadsheet and knew I would write too. I arri I'd arrived on Queer Street, but it wasn't the street Rose had predicted. This street was fun and parties and talking and shouting. It was also scary. It was marching for law reforms it was enduring the hate and the cries from the onlookers. Get back to the gutter where you belong. This queer street was discussion, endless discussion, late into the night. Rose was from the do it because I say so kind of school. She was not a fan of let's discuss it. I can't say I was either. I like to get things done. But those women on queer street made room for me. I got a part-time job at the university bookshop and decided heaven was here on earth. To hell with sitting at the feet of Jesus. This was good enough for me. I started writing seriously. I wrote plays. I wrote theatrical reviews. When I was awarded the ONZM, I laughed along with the audience when the nice guy with the beautiful voice read out the titles of my works, asking for it. What did you do in the war, mummy? The MCP show. And I kept reading, and I'm still reading. 
albeit with big type, on an iPad. At my 90th birthday party, my oldest son said when he thought of me, it was me reading. He says I would be reading when he got home from school and I would get up, see to him and his brothers, give them a biscuit or two, a glass of milk, send them out to play and settle back down with a book. I was a rose duplicate. He says I used to take them, the three of them, to the river, find a safe spot, get them sorted, then once they were in the water, I'd open a book and immediately be found, be lost to the world. I suppose I'd have looked up if one of them was drowning, but who knows? <laughs> Reading books has been my salvation, my education, my relaxation and my love. I suppose it was almost inevitable that one day I would start losing my sight. Life, Rose had informed me more than once, is not fair. I have a little library on my front, front fence, and when I put it up, I imagined I'd refill it every couple of days with books from my own library. But it refills itself. At least the people who love the books do. After the first refill five years ago, I've only put in four books. The rest of, have been put in and taken out by people who like reading, all age groups. They don't have to replace the books. They borrow, but it's, it's like they want to. Um, they want to spread the love of books, I suppose. Some knock on my door and say, thank you. And I say, it's a pleasure, because it is. Reading books will continue. Early one morning, I had a slightly irritable text from one granddaughter. It said, Nan, for God's sake, he woke me up at five this morning to read in that damn dug the bug again. <laughs> My 10-year-old granddaughter reads adult books as well as ones from her own age group, and she likes rereading too. Reading books, whether from print or on pages or on a screen continues because we need stories. We need facts and we need adventures. There is nothing like that personal connection that happens between us and the words on a page or a screen. Just us and the words. I was taught to read before I was five and that was just the best gift anyone has ever given me. I fell in love with it then and I love it still. Books are not about covers or about print. They're about words. They're about the words writers write. They're about life and death and war and lovers and children. They're about cities and good people and bad people. They're about strange lands and strange happenings. And they're about this land and the strange historical story cover-ups and the the, history, the glory of the uncoverings. Books, plays, poetry, short stories, novels, non-fiction, they feed us. They heal the broken places. They teach us new things, lead us back to old. They are still working. The internet is great. I love technology, but there is room in our lives for more than one love. I was about 11 when Rose said, if you don't get your head out of a book, my girl, you'll end up on Queer Street. Well, Rose, you were right. I didn't take my head out of a book, and I did end up on Queer Street. It's not the Queer Street you meant, not the one where all the pawnbrokers and secondhand shops are, where the poor people go, and it's not one that's always sunshine and roses either. On this queer street, we had to struggle and march and smile and shout. We had to sit and talk and argue. We had to read and tell our stories. We had to write a new ending. And we had to heal ourselves. And on this street called queer, that's exactly what we did and exactly what we do. I'd like to thank Juliet and Melissa for inviting me to talk about reading. To Polly and Jessie, and I've got the names of the others, Maddie, Hypatia, Annie, 
Bryden, Hope. They all work for Fitireo Publishing and they made the little book that you can see. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for listening and to just say, e toka noa, te toka, e raukau rā, te rākau, kia tāpuri a, ano ki te rakorero. A stone is just a stone, a tree is just a tree, until it is a story. Kia ora and thank you. Ko Juliet Toko Ingua. Kia ora Renee, thank you for your words, your time and your generosity. It's been one of our great pleasures to work with you this year. I'd like to add to Big C's chorus of thanks to the people who have supported us tonight and who do continue to support our work. Luke Pearson, Creative New Zealand. Thank you Stephen and Malcolm for coming tonight from Creative New Zealand. Rachel Esson and the National Library the interns of Fitirea Polytechnic and to their tutor, Odessa. We've been so grateful for how you've taken this work to your heart as well, and that's um, been a huge pleasure for us as well. I would like to thank Melissa Wastney, who's the comms manager for Read NZ, and she did all of this, and I just would like to thank you, wherever you go, <laughs> um, for your care, for your professionalism, and for your behind the scenes work to bring us all together. It's a huge amount of work and Melissa does it with a huge amount of love. I would just like to mihi to Anahira and Nadine for your beautiful mihi and your karakia. And if you would like to support the work that Read NZ does, please hop online to readnz.org and make a tax free donation. We would like to thank you, our audience, for coming tonight and to those who have joined us on the live stream. Next year, Read NZ celebrates 50 years and we've got some really cool stuff planned and we'd love to share that with you and we look forward to making those announcements in due course. And we're going to finish with karakia. Kia ora. Kia ora no tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko te tū mana ko kua, uh, kua, um, pai tēnei uh, noho tēnei kaupapa kōrero anō he, he mihi uh, ki a koe e te, e te whaia uh, me te whānau. Hoki ora mai ki o koutou whānau, uh, noho haumaru mai i te kāinga. I te reo pākau. Oh, um, thank you so much, Renee. It's been amazing being here. Um, please, um, all our love, remember your, your family and uh, hiaha, kia atu, what else did you say? And, and go well. <laughs> and and kia, uh, stay safe. <coughs> yes. Kia ora. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and we're going to uh, close with a, a um, karakia that you may know, so please join us if so. And we're going to do it in song. Ne. Aye. Whakataka te hau. Ki te uru uru, whakataka te hau, ki te tonga, ki a makina ki nga ki uta, ki a matara tara ki tai. He hiya ke ana te atakura, he tio, he uka, he hauhu. Oh.
all together now. See you.